All right, we're on our last unit of derivatives here. Um, this first section is not terrible. We've been prepping a lot to answer these questions, so um, this, this shouldn't be a stretch to extend here with this extreme value theorem. Uh, so again, it's an existence theorem. Before we get into defining the theorem, um, we're going to look at some definitions here. Um, so what's the definition or what's the difference between a relative extrema and an absolute extrema? So we'll say relative So extrema are points So relative extrema are any spot where a function changes from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. Those are relative extrema. You can think of those as extremes in their relative area. They're also called local extrema. Absolute extrema. are the points point or points should say value or values all right so the absolute extrema are the points that are the greatest on the entire graph not just in the area or the least so um, they are the absolute the they're um, the definitive highest and lowest points and graphs don't always have to have absolute extrema um, so let's look at these two graphs for example um, two very different looking graph. I mean, they look sort of the same, but um, the thing to note is the domain is all reals on this graph. On, uh, what is this? F? That's F. And then they're calling this one G. The domain is from negative five to six inclusive. So that's going to matter when there's endpoints, a closed interval versus an interval, uh, open interval. Let's look at F. So that's the graph of F. Um, identify coordinates of the relative extrema. So we've got a relative minimum here, a relative maximum here, and a relative minimum there. So we're going to say we've got relative minimum at negative 3, 0, and 2, negative 6. Yeah, and then we've got a relative maximum at negative 1, 3. Uh, let's look at any absolute extrema. So um, for absolute minimum, this is the lowest point on the graph. So that is the absolute minimum. And then the absolute maximum. We have none on this graph because of these arrows. Even though this is a relative maximum, it's not the highest point on the graph because all these infinite points up here are bigger. And since the arrow keeps going, there is no absolute maximum. Um, 
on the domain of the given function, the absolute term. Um, so let's talk, we got to summarize. So let's first do G. So now let's look at the graph of G. Uh, relative extrema, we're going to have relative minimums here and here. So we'll say we have relative minimum at negative 3, negative 4, and 3, 2. We've got a relative maximum at negative 1, 4. On this domain, what are the coordinates of the absolute extrema? So again, this has a domain from negative 5 to 6. So now it's going to definitely have an absolute uh, maximum and an absolute minimum because it's a closed interval. So the absolute minimum is this point here, which is negative 3, negative 4. And then we have an absolute maximum at this endpoint, uh, 6, 5. That's the highest point on the graph. So on the domain of the given function, did the absolute extrema occur at, at the function's relative extrema? So let's talk about f first. On the graph of f, the absolute minimum occurred at a relative minimum on the graph of G the absolute minimum occurred at a relative minimum also say but it's I think I put it down here. but it's absolute maximum did not occur at one of its relative maximums. So we're just kind of establishing that the absolute max or min doesn't have to be occur at a relative max or min. So uh, let's move on and look at the next set of graphs. Um, now we're going to talk about specific intervals. So on this first graph here, F, if we look at the closed interval, negative 2, so that's from here, to 3. So now we're just looking on this part of the graph, and it's closed, so the endpoints are included. If we look at that, there has to be an absolute maximum in now because we've closed the interval. So uh, what are the absolute extrema? The absolute maximum on this graph is negative one three and the absolute minimum is at two negative six still um, now let's look on a different interval negative four to one if we change the interval again because it's closed this may change what our extreme values are. Okay, so 
uh, our absolute extreme values are. So negative four to one. So now we're looking on this interval from negative four to one. So now we might change our absolute maximum and absolute minimum. So the absolute max on this graph is actually going to be at one of the endpoints. Um, this point right here is higher than the relative minimum. So that's going to occur at negative 4, 4. And the absolute minimum is going to occur at the other end point. That's going to be 1, negative 3. Uh, let's check out this other graph from negative 4 to 5. So for now we're going on this interval from negative 4 to 5. So we're looking at this section of the graph. What are the absolute extrema of G? So we've got an absolute maximum actually at two points here and here. So that's going to be negative 1, 4, and 5, 4. Notice they have the same y value because that's the highest y value over that interval. We've got an absolute min at negative 3, negative 4. Now if we change the interval from negative 2 to, ne uh, to positive 6, now we're going from here to here. That may change our absolute extrema because we're changing the closed interval. So we've got an absolute maximum at 6, 5. That's an endpoint. And then an absolute min at also the endpoint, negative 2, 0. Keep in mind, it's a min because this, or sorry, a max because this y value of that point will be bigger than any y value anywhere else on any point. It'll be the biggest y value on any point on this interval. And for the minimum, this will be the lowest y value. So that's how we find our extreme values on closed intervals. We're just finding out which ones have the biggest y value and which ones have the smallest y value. So let's look at when the domain is restricted. Let's make a summary here. At what three places that the absolute extrema could exist? So, um, absolute extrema could exist first at the endpoints of the closed interval. Closed is key. Uh, the second place they could occur is at any relative extrema. So relative extrema are going to come from two kinds of x values. So we don't have to prove, like we don't have to do sign analysis to see if they're extrema. Uh, this will allow us to do a little bit of shortcut if we have a closed interval. We know relative extrema come from when the derivative is zero or also when it's undefined. We don't actually have to test it to see if it is an extrema when we have a closed interval. Again, that's the key. I know like we say that it maybe it might not that it might not be an extreme um, a relative extrema. Like maybe the sign analysis shows positive positive even though the derivative was zero there. But we don't care when we're looking for absolute extrema on a closed interval. We don't care if these turn out to be where f prime of x is zero or undefined. We don't care if those two x values turn out to be relative extrema or not because we're not concerned with relative extrema. We are concerned with absolute extrema. So we are going to test their y values anyway. Plug them into the original, see what their y values are, and we're just going to compare those to the endpoints. And whichever has the biggest y value, that's going to be the absolute maximum. And whatever has the smallest y value, that's going to be uh, the absolute minimum. So there's no need to test if they're actually relative extrema. And that's what the ex extreme value theorem says. And it's an existence theorem, just like the intermediate value theorem.
this theorem on its own does not tell you what the extreme value is. It just tells you that one of them exists at certain points. So let's talk about, let's, let's get this theorem uh, on paper. So if f of x is continuous, so just like intermediate value theorem, you need to show this first of all to make it app applicable. If f of x is continuous on the closed interval from a to b, then this says there exists. It's an existence theorem. Then there exists an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum. on that closed interval at either x equals a, x equals b, so on either endpoint or any value on the open interval. Okay, so we're already checking the endpoints. So now we can just look at all the rest of the values on the interval the open interval, right? We don't have to worry about closing the A and the B because um, we're going to check those automatically all the time. So on the open interval, um, any value of X that might be a relative extrema, and there's no worth, uh, on, if we give it, again, I'll say it again, if we have a closed interval, there's no point in taking time to find out, do sign analysis and find out if it's a relative extrema or not. Like if it, if it maybe it goes plus plus, so that we don't have, we actually have a, uh, a horizontal tangent line, but um, we have a horizontal tangent, but we don't have a relative maximum or minimum there. Um, it's not worth our time to do the sign analysis on the derivative if it's positive, positive, or if, it's, if it actually switches, because uh, we're gonna plug in the x's and find the y values anyway. So it's gonna be, we're gonna test the endpoints or any value on the open interval such that the derivative equals zero or is undefined because we know that's where our relative extrema come from anyway. So that's what the theorem says. It's an existence theorem. Uh, so let's try to use the theorem. So we're going to consider this cubic function. We've got a graph of it here and we're considering it over a closed interval. Um, and what we're going to do here is, um, again, it's on a closed interval, so there has to be an absolute maximum or minimum. We're going to look at answering all these questions. So identify the absolute maximum of f on the closed interval, negative 4 to negative 1. So um, that's actually not this entire graph we're looking at. you got to pay attention to your endpoints of your interval. From negative 4 to negative 1 is just this part of the graph. All right, so the absolute maximum is going to occur in two spots. And that's going to be at negative 4, 6, and negative 1, 6. What's the uh, absolute minimum over this same interval? That's going to occur at negative 3, 2. Now we're going to do the same thing for the interval from negative 4 to positive 1, which is the entire graph you're looking at here, because positive 1, it shoots all the way down there to negative 14. So now we're looking at this entire graph. What's the absolute maximum on that graph? It's still the same maximum. It's going to occur in two spots. At negative 4, 6, that's the end point, And at that relative maximum, negative 1, 6. Identify the absolute minimum. Well, the lowest point on the graph is clearly this value, 1, negative 14. Okay, so now... Um, we're going to use our extreme value theorem to locate the absolute extrema on that graph, like without the graph, but it's that same function. Um, on the, we're going to do it with algebra without looking at the graph to see if we can kind of get the same answers. Okay, so um, let's take a look at taking, well, first we want to take the derivative to find out where it's equal to zero and where it's undefined. So let's start with that derivative. Derivative. 
uh, negative 3x squared minus 12x minus 9. Um, now we want to find out, it's never undefined because there's no derivative, it's a polynomial, so we just want to find out where it's equal to 0. So it looks like we're going to have to factor this thing. Let's pull out a negative 3. So uh, the derivative is equal to 0 when each one of those factors is equal to 0. So x is going to be negative 3 and x is going to be negative 1. So now if we want to find our absolute maximum and minimum, we have a, an interval. Um, and this one happens to also be the endpoint of the interval. So we're just going to check our all our values for a relative max and relative min. So the first value we check is our leftmost endpoint, f of negative 4. Um, then we'll check our other endpoint, f of negative 1. We've got to always check our endpoints by the extreme value theorem. And then any rel possible relative extrema which occur at these two values. We're already testing negative 1, so we just have to test negative 3. We're plugging these into the original because we're talking about the original function, the highest and the lowest value on the original. So if I plug them in up here to this function, f of negative 4 produces 6, f of negative 1 produces 6, and f of negative 3 produces 2. So um, what we have is we're going to say f of x has an absolute maximum at x, um, oh, sorry, at negative 4, the highest one, there's two of them, they're tied, right? Negative 4, 6, and negative 1, 6. And that's what we found from looking at the graph. We're looking at how can we do this without the graph. Um, and then f of x has an absolute minimum at the lowest value here. The lowest y value is 2. So at negative 3, 2. And that's what we found graphically. So that's how we do it without the graph. Now we change the interval and go from negative 4 to 1, which we know changed some of our answers. Um, so let's do that same idea. We are, we already have our we took our derivative already So we know that the derivative still um, Will be uh, Equal to zero when x equals negative 3 and When x equals negative 1 so first we got to check the y value at our endpoints and Then we also have to check the y value at any possible relative extrema any, the extreme value theorem says any one of our uh, ma absolute maxes or absolute mins have to come from one of these values. So we just got to check these and see which ones are the biggest and which ones are the smallest. So f of negative 4 is 6. f of 1 is negative 14. And we're just plugging into our f of x here. Uh, f of negative 3 is 2. And f of negative 1 is 6. So for our highest point, we're going to say f of x has an absolute maximum and again there's a tie at negative 4 6 and negative 1 6 f of x has an absolute minimum at uh, 1 negative 14 in this case the lowest y value is that endpoint at 1 and that confirms what we found from the graph up above all right so let's look at um first of all not forgetting about you know we want to we want to make sure we recall that you got to make sure the graph is continuous over the given interval so we're going to look at all these functions over this interval and see if the extreme value theorem is or is not applicable so on the first one, the extreme value theorem is not applicable Whoops, it's H um, I keep writing it like a little F uh, For H of X on this interval 
because h of x has a discontinuity at x equals 3. I'm sorry, x equals negative 3, which is on the interval. So we can't apply the extreme value theorem. Um, and it's for obvious reasons. If it's not continuous, then I don't know what the maximum min is. If I have a jump discontinuity, the graph is no longer smooth, and that can mess up what my highest and my lowest points are. If you don't understand that, we can talk about it in class. How do we find the domain of this function? We haven't talked a lot about when there's a square root. Um, you need everything under the square root to always be positive. Um, so what we say is, uh, I should say non-negative, zero is okay. So what we say is the radicand, that's the part on the square root, is bigger than zero. And if we solve that for x, that gives us our domain for this function. The domain is all x is bigger than three. So um, outside of those values, so anything less than or equal to three, this function is not defined. So... Um, that's our interval is negative 5 to 0. The entire interval is not defined. So then we're going to say that the extreme value does not is not applicable applicable as well. So the domain of g of x is 3 to infinity, which means the extreme value theorem is not applicable since g of x is not defined at every value, I want to say at all values on the interval. negative 5 to 0. And then the last one, uh, let's look at the domain of a log function. Log functions also um, have to be um, non-negative. So that means what's inside the log has to be bigger than or equal to 0. Equal to 0 is OK. Um, so, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, 0 is no good with logs. So it has to be um, positive. So x plus 7. Um, has to be bigger than zero. So when I solve this, that gives me my domain. So x has to be larger than negative seven. So now um, that means that our interval is okay because our domain here is all x values larger than negative seven. So the interval is gonna be continuous everywhere on that interval. So since the domain of f of x is negative 7 to infinity f of x is defined and continuous so that's the key part that's continuous on the entire interval negative 5 to 0 so therefore the extreme value theorem is applicable. Um, and when I was doing the, um, the domain here for the natural log, a natural log or any log, you can't take the log of zero and you can't take the log of a negative number. Uh, but what I noticed was up here, this should be actually equal to. The radicand has to be non-negative the part underneath the square root can also can be can be zero so this is actually the domain all x bigger than or equal to three three is okay because i can have a zero under the square root right because if i have three minus three i get the square root of zero and then zero that's zero and then zero times six is zero so i do not get undefined you can square root a negative number so um i just wanted to go back and fix that all right, so let's just do a little bit. What do we have here? We've got four examples.
um, and we want to de determine their extreme values, their absolute maximums and their absolute minimums. So we don't have graphs on these, but what we're going to do is we're going to take the derivative. So I get 3x squared minus 4x minus 3. And then I want to find that that derivative is never undefined. So I want to find one that's equal to 0. So I'm going to factor this thing. Um, so we're looking for like it would be a 3x and an x. Uh, I can't think of any combinations that would work out here. Um, like if I split the middle term or whatever. So I'm thinking these are irrational. So um, yeah, what we're going to do is this would be a calculator one. So you would do the quadratic formula on your calculator or you can graph this quadratic and locate the zeros or you can graph this quadratic in y1 and then zero in y2 and find the intersects. Um, and let's see, we would find out that the derivative is equal to zero at x equals negative 0 0.535. We always go three decimal places and x equals 1.869. All right, so now we want to test for our extreme value, our extreme values here, our absolute maxes and min. So we always test the endpoints and then any possible extrema. And remember, we're testing the original function here because we're finding where the original function has maximums and minimums. So I'm going to get negative 2, negative 2, negative 1.21, and this one is negative 8.065. You can pause the video and plug those in with your calculator. So um, the biggest or the maximum um, is going to be this guy. And the minimum will be that guy. So we're going to say f of x. Has an absolute. Maximum. Um, at do they want the point or do they want. Um, actually there's on the given interval. Provide the extreme value. Thing, if not states. But so. So our extreme values. This has an absolute maximum at negative point of five three five, but they want the actual value. So we're gonna say an absolute maximum of negative one point one two one. They don't want where it's located, they want what is the extreme value. What is the actual y value? Um, and then it has minimum value of negative 8.065 on the given interval. All right, now let's check out this next one. Um, we look at the interval on pi over 2 to 2 pi and make sure that this graph is continuous on it well um, it's continuous everywhere um, there's no denominator or square roots here I can find the cosine and the sine value for all of these values so it is continuous on the interval so now let's do the derivative you want to think of sine squared as sine of x squared so it's chain rule so we've got 2 sine of x to the power of one times, now we gotta do the chain rule, the inner function is cosine, the derivative of the inner function is cosine of x, minus the derivative of cosine of x, so it's plus a negative, because uh, it's sine of x there, negative sine of x. So um, now we gotta plug in our endpoints, or first we wanna find where there's possible relative extrema. So we're going to, um, again, use our calculator here. So g prime of x equals zero when x equals pi and when x equals 5.236. So you want to use your calculator to graph your derivative in y1 and in y2 graph 0 and then find the intersect on this given interval. So now we're going to test 
our endpoints and then our possible extrema which are going to be pi and 5.236 so when we plug those in for G we're going to get 1 1 negative 1 and 1.25 so which ones are maximum which ones are minimum there's our absolute max there's our absolute min 1.25 is the largest y value so that's our maximum so we say g of x has an absolute maximum value of 1.25 and an absolute minimum value of negative 1 on the interval pi over 2 2 pi All right, last couple. So we got to think about the continuity on this interval. Um, so we want to look at what is the graph of x plus 2 to the 2 thirds? Does it have any discontinuities? So this means that we're cube rooting x plus 2. I kind of look at it this way. And so a cube root is not like a square root. We can cube root negatives. So for any x value, we can cube root it. And then the 2 just means we're squaring the answer afterwards. So this um, function is continuous for all reals, so it's continuous on this interval. So the EVT will be applicable. So let's do our derivative here. This is a chain rule, the 2 thirds comes down. We reduce the power by 1 times the derivative of the inner. So we want to find out where this derivative is equal to 0. Well first let's simplify a little bit, get rid of that negative exponent. And now we can say that um, when is it equal to zero? Well, the derivative is never equal to zero because the top is just two. And the derivative will be undefined when the bottom equals zero. So let's do that. Um, the three, so the three can never be zero, but the x plus two may be zero. And remember, we just focus on making the inner factor zero. To the one third power doesn't matter because if we make the inside zero, whatever x makes the inside zero, zero to any power will be zero. So it looks like the only possible relative extrema is at negative two, an x value of negative two. Um, so to test for our extreme value theorem here, we're gonna test our endpoints at negative three, at six, and then at our possible relative extrema, negative two. We plug those into the um, original function. So negative three, we get one, 6 we get 4 and negative 2 we're getting 0 so our absolute minimum is here and our absolute maximum is there so we're going to say that f of x has a maximum value of 4 and an absolute Oh, I should say an absolute maximum minimum value of zero on the interval negative three to six. Last one, we think about the domain. So um, for a, a log function, there we do have to check there is an issue with domain on a log function. So let's see what that domain is. A log function, the part inside the log has to be positive. So the way I find domain with this is I'm going to solve any x's um, that make this positive. That's going to be those are going that's going to be the domain. So. When it's a cubic, I'm um, sorry, a quadratic function, I have to factor it, and I'm going to do a sign analysis on this function actually. So I got, I know that it's zero at negative two and two, 
So negative 2 and 2 um, are right out. Right out because um, if I plug those in, that means I get 0. That's what these are. These are the zeros, right? Um, they're the spots where this function is neither negative nor positive. So if I try to if I plug in a 2 here, I get uh, 4 minus 4 is 0. So I'm trying to take the log of 0. That number does not exist. Um, but we want to check these intervals. Any positive intervals, that's the domain. So if I plug in a negative 3, um, whoops, to do a sign analysis, I'll plug in a negative 3 here and see if I get a, a, a true, like an OK statement or not, because I want it to be bigger than 0. So if I plug in negative 3, I get a negative times a negative is a positive. So that's good. If I plug in uh, any number on this interval from negative 2 to 2, like 0, I get a positive times a negative. So that's a negative. So this interval, uh, has none of these x values can be in the domain because they would make the part inside the log negative, which we cannot take the uh, log of a negative number. And then if I plug in three, I get a positive times a positive. So the domain of this function is all x is uh, bigger, sorry, less than negative two, and it can't be equal to negative two because that makes it zero or all x is bigger than 2. Um, so our interval, negative 1 to 3, kind of is from here, negative 1 to 3. So clearly all these spots in here um, are not inside the domain of the function. Therefore, the extreme value theorem does not apply. So we can just pick any one of those values and show that uh, it makes that that's not the functions undefined there. Therefore, we have a discontinuity. So let's pick two. Two is in our interval. That's easy to plug in. Um, so I'll say the extreme value theorem is not applicable because at x, I just need to show one counterexample. At x equals 2, which is on the given interval h of x is undefined and therefore is not continuous. We'd we'll go back to the definition of continuity. For function to be con uh, continuous at an x value, um, f of 2 has to be defined, or sorry, in this case, h, h of 2 has to be defined. The limit as x approaches 2 has to exist, and the two things have to be equal. Well, we're showing that h of 2 is undefined uh, right off. So, um, so that value, like I said, is right out, cannot be continuous. So therefore, the EVT does not apply. I think that's the end of our notes. It is.